funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child, and RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, the Attorney General issues a new policy on police use of force during mental health encounters as the family of a Jersey City man killed by law enforcement takes legal action. We called for help, you know, and they sent armed police officers who broke down his door, shot and killed him. And people have to be held accountable. Plus, Congressman Andy Kim and Senator Cory Booker take center stage on night three of the Democratic National Convention amid ongoing ceasefire protests An uncommitted New Jersey delegate speaks out. Unfortunately, they have made their voices loud and clear that they do not believe that Palestinian voices should be heard. Also, big shoes to fill in the wake of the death of longtime Congressman Bill Pascrell, who will be appointed to fill his role. And Guns Down, Gloves Up, a new summer boxing program in Trenton aims to use the sport as a strategy to give kids a fighting chance. So it's not only um, uh, physical benefits of this, but also uh, an emotional support group in terms of friends as well. There's a camaraderie that's formed outside of the ring. And Jay Spotlight News begins right now. From NJPBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Thursday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. We begin with a few key stories we're following. New Jersey's Attorney General issued new rules today on how police officers use force, specifically when dealing with situations involving barricaded subjects who are frequently in a behavioral or mental health crisis. The new policy requires mental health professionals to join with officers during negotiations by offering guidance or by communicating with the person who's barricaded. It also directs first responding officers to wait for appropriate resources to arrive and not force a resolution, among several other items. The attorney general's directives will take effect in October and, according to the office, comes after more than a year of studies and meetings with law enforcement agencies agencies across the country. But it also follows the tragic death of a 25-year-old Fort Lee woman who was fatally shot by police in her apartment last month during an apparent mental health crisis. The family of the victim, Victoria Lee, issued their first public statement today since police body camera footage was released of the incident and said, in part, they remain in shock and grief following the events, but are also appalled by the lack of discretion with which the police handled Victoria mental health crisis. Well, a Jersey City family who lost a loved one to a police-involved shooting a year ago this week filed a lawsuit against the department. Ted Goldberg will have more on that later in the show. And an update on a story we've been following for months now. Rutgers University is banning encampments on campus after months of volatility following pro-Palestinian protests. The university this week issued new rules around its free expression policy, which now prohibits encampments where students set up tents in ongoing protests. Students will also need to get permission from the university to hold demonstrations, and it puts limits on where they can set it up. The move comes as Rutgers tries to get a better handle on potential campus protests this fall after the university had to postpone final exams for roughly a thousand students last spring due to threats of escalation from pro protesters in the encampment. That all came to an end following an agreement between organizers and university leadership, but Rutgers was later criticized for meeting some of the demands and was summoned to a congressional hearing to defend how the administration handled protests. 
And Jersey takes center stage on night three of the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Senator Cory Booker and Congressman Andy Kim both had prominent speaking slots in the evening's lineup. Booker is a co-chair for the convention and had several opportunities to talk to the crowd, gaveling in the session, then serving as an MC by introducing other speakers. He used his moments on stage to criticize Donald Trump and pay homage to the late Congressman Bill Powell. Pascrell, then energized the crowd in a speech where he talked about hope, leading the audience in chants of, I believe in America. I believe in America, where we share common ground and common cause and one common destiny. And let me tell you, if you believe in America, if you love in America, then you will work for America. And when we work together, when we stand together, when we organize together, when we vote together, I will tell you this, when we fight, we win. Andy Kim, who's running for the seat now vacated by Bob Menendez, used his speech to talk about the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, where he was famously photographed cleaning up glass and other debris in the Capitol Rotunda the day after the riots. Kim urged Democrats to heal America for the next generation. What I learned on January 6th is that all of us, all of us, are caretakers for our great republic. We can heal this country, but only if we try. Many of you are doing your part through your voices and your votes. Always remember, this chaos that we see, it doesn't have to be this way. Among the other speakers were parents of an Israeli-American hostage who was kidnapped by Hamas during the October 7th attack, putting the Israel-Hamas war on the forefront of delegates' minds. For the 30 uncommitted delegates attending, the war is the key reason for their presence, as they work to include a call for a ceasefire in Gaza to be part of the DNC platform. Well, one of those delegates is Ahmad Hawad from New Jersey, who joins me now from Chicago. Ahmad, thank you for taking a few minutes. Let me start with this news that you and the fellow uncommitted delegates received, which is that the folks at the DNC have denied your request to have an American Palestinian speak to the convention. Absolutely. So around 8 p.m. yesterday evening, as I was inside the United Center um, at the DNC, uh, I received word from the co-founder of the ununited, uh, uncommitted movement, Abbas Alawiya, that the DNC has rejected our request to have a Palestinian-American speaker um, highlight the Palestinian uh, cause on the DNC's main stage. So, I mean, talk to me about the reaction there and how you all are processing that, because it seems anyway, at least from those of us at home, that many of the demands, requests that the uncommitted delegates have made have gone unmet. You know, it was very disturbing, to say the least. Um, it's disgusting when you have a, the Democratic Party continue to highlight that they are the party of inclusion, that all are welcome in the party and we are under one big tent. So when we were informed that a Palestinian American voice will not be allowed at the DNC, we were extremely angered by this decision. And in response, myself, as well as many of the other delegates, we decided that we're going to step outside of the convention. And there was a sit in that has began yesterday at 8 p.m. and it's still ongoing to this moment. And the request is simple. We are asking for a simple request of a few minutes to be able to discuss the Palestinian cause in the Palestinian suffering that has been ongoing for the past 10 months in front of the public on the DNC stage. And unfortunately, they have made their voices loud and clear that they do not believe that Palestinian voices should be heard. And so what do you see and what do the, your fellow uncommitted delegates see as your role now that that decision has been made? Um, Kamala Harris is poised to accept the party's nomination. And um, there was a family, parents of an American Israeli hostage uh, who spoke last night. What do you see as your role being there at this point? Our role is still remaining the same. 
We're calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. We are calling for an arms embargo on Israel, not another bomb sent to support Netanyahu's genocidal campaign in Gaza. It is time for the Democratic Party to change their policy and adopt a policy which the vast majority of Democrats, the vast majority of Americans support, and that is for an arms embargo, not another bomb to kill innocent Palestinian children. These demands, these requests that have been being made, if, if they're going unmet and unheard, do you feel like then maybe the convention was not the right avenue to try to get at this, just given how it's played out so far? No, I don't believe so. I think that this is the correct avenue, and I believe that we are going to remain steadfast in our commitment to making our voices heard. We're going to continue to demand that the Harris campaign uh, adopt a policy shift and adopt policy change. No more empty words. We need action. There's 70 days remaining until the election. And I can tell you that myself, as well as the other delegates that are here, that are uncommitted delegates, we want to support the Democratic Party moving into November. But until we see Vice President Harris and the Democratic Party adopt positions that are uh, felt and, and, and are near and dear to the hearts of many within the party and are supported by the vast majority of the Democratic Party, um, we're going to continue just to voice our concerns and voice our opinions and uh, see how the next couple of months go leading up to the November election. Ahmad Awad is an uncommitted delegate from New Jersey, one of two uh, from New Jersey, one of 30 total at the DNC. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Brianna. I appreciate the platform. Meanwhile, Democrats are still processing the loss of Congressman Bill Pascrell, who died on Wednesday at the age of 87. But as they mourn, they're also facing an incredibly tight timeline to pick his successor. The deadline for the party to submit replacement nominees is exactly one week from today, on August 29th. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has more on what happens next. He's a Jersey legend. He is a powerful pugilist, a prince of Patterson. Senator Cory Booker spoke passionately to Democrats gathered at the convention in Chicago about New Jersey's loss. Congressman Bill Pascrell, who had served his 9th district constituents and his home city with fierce devotion for almost three decades, passed away at the age of 87. He never forgot where he came from in Patterson. That's why he is a true legend, a true career public servant, that fighter, and he really, he really was your friend. Lieutenant Governor Tahisha Way says Pascrell offered gentle support as she pursued her own political career in Passaic County, but minced no words on the congressional battlefield. As a member of the Ways and Means Committee, he relentlessly pursued Donald Trump's tax records and suffered no pushback. He said that I was being intemperate. Being lectured on civility from someone who works for the president, President Trump, it's like taking chivalry lessons from Jack the Ripper. Pascrell championed funding for firefighter safety, treatment for traumatic brain injury, and laws governing tax fairness. During the recent debate over congestion pricing, a prickly Pascrell threatened New York officials. We are not the MTA's ATM, period. And if they don't know that by now, they're going to learn it. Bill Pascrell loved his city. He got President Obama to declare the Great Falls a national park. He loved his job, happily gave roll call a tour of his Washington office. And he absolutely adored baseball and intimidating rivals. I used to eat a little dirt before every game to try to scare the other kids. And that guy is totally nuts. And he had no intention of retiring, he said nine years ago in that roll call interview. I know I'm on the downside of the mountain. I tell my wife, I don't even think about retiring because the moment I begin to think about it, that's when I know I gotta get out. Pascrell's death this week has left 9th District Democratic County Committee members scrambling. Even as they grieve his passing, they're facing an August 29th deadline, mere days to fill the suddenly vacant space for Pascrell's seat on this November's ballot, says writers Micah Rasmussen. 
you're not going to see the party miss this deadline. Uh, there will be a convention between now and next week when the deadline hits. Assemblyman Benji Wimberly says his hat will be in the ring when the committees vote. As long as he was here, um, as long as he wanted to be the congressman, I was there to support him and his family. And uh, I didn't waver uh, from that. And, uh, you know, uh, part of my uh, heart is, you know, hurt and or broken and stuff. But I know, like you said, I think he would be like, you know, coach, <laughs> time to, you know, get the game plan together and get moving. And, uh, you know, I will, you know, at some point officially, uh, uh, you know, enter the race. Other possible contenders include Patterson Mayor Andre Saya, who offered condolences to Pascrell's family, but hasn't yet said if he'll run for his seat. Nor has Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter, who also had expressed prior interest. Ultimately, committee members in Passaic, Bergen and Hudson must quickly choose a candidate. This is not a special election situation because there is so little time left in the remainder of Pascrell's term. We are in all likelihood not talking about a situation where the governor would call a special election to fill the remainder of the term. That is what's happening in the neighboring 10th district where primary voters picked Democrat LaMonica McIver to replace the late Congressman Donald Payne. But Pascrell's seat will remain empty until the next Congress is sworn in. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. As we mentioned at the top of the show, the family of Andrew Jerome Washington filed a lawsuit this week against Jersey City, alleging the police officers who responded to his mental health crisis last year failed to follow standard de-escalation techniques, alleging, much like the family of Victoria Lee, that his death could have been avoided if officers had taken a different approach. Ted Goldberg reports. They robbed us of that opportunity just to see him healthy again because it was possible. He had done this for nearly 30 years. Courtney Washington doesn't want people to remember her brother Andrew as someone who suffered a mental health crisis and was killed by police. He had a full life, you know, he had girlfriends, he, he dated, he, he had jobs, he spent time with family, he was a, a big part of our lives. It's not violent. Almost a year ago, the Washington family called a mental health hotline when Drew was suffering through a mental health event. You're not in trouble, you're not under arrest. The response is now subject to a lawsuit filed by Washington's family. They allege that the Jersey City Police Department didn't do enough to de-escalate the situation, which led to police knocking down his door and shooting Drew when he stepped forward with a knife. We called for help, you know, and they sent armed police officers who broke down his door, shot and killed him. And people have to be held accountable. There was no reason for them to break down the door when they did, and it violated basic principles of de-escalation um, when they should have waited, they should have called a mental health professional. The lawsuit names as defendants Jersey City, Hudson County, Jersey City Medical Center, RWJ Barnabas Health, and 11 officers and EMTs. From the beginning, of this entire incident, the Jersey City Police Department officers violated the basic principles set out nationally and by the state of New Jersey for how to interact with someone experiencing mental health symptoms. He's not bad, he's not evil, he was sick, but uh, that didn't make him any less dangerous, unfortunately, to those officers at that time. The day after the shooting, leaders in Jersey City defended how the police responded. When you look at the footage of actually what transpired, you'd be hard pressed to say that we could have taken a different approach. They arrived at the scene based on the medical center's advice. They entered or they went to the door and communicated with Mr. Washington for close to an hour. There's kind of a mistaken impression. Uh, I think that we can bring psychiatrists to all of these jobs and have them talk to the person or lead the person. Uh, they can, we can only introduce an unarmed civilian into this job if the area is secure. An unarmed civilian is a big part of Arrive Together, the statewide initiative that pairs mental health professionals with police to respond to certain 911 calls. Jersey City is not a member, but the city is applying for a $2 million grant to expand social services for people suffering from mental health events. The grant comes from the Seabrooks Washington Act, a law named for Drew and Najee Seabrooks who was shot and killed by Patterson police 
half a year before Drew was. A therapeutic crisis response team, of course, but also an expansion of what we already do with licensed uh, social workers and therapeutic services um, in Jersey City for continuum and follow-up care. Pam Johnson wrote this grant application for Jersey City. The city was rejected during the first phase of funding when the grant was written by someone else. We're just here to prevent, um, you know, something happening to where it's, it's escalated and, and something like what happened to Andrew Washington and Najee, and Najee Seabrooks. You know, we don't want to see that again. Lawsuits like this start conversations and they could, you know, bring about change. And that would be important for our family and for the next family that has to make that call. The city told us in a statement they could not comment on active litigation even as this shooting sparked another conversation about responding to mental health emergencies. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Ted Goldberg. And in our Spotlight on Business report tonight, stocks slid today with tech leading the losses as investors turned their focus to a key speech from the Fed chair on Friday. Here's how the markets closed. And finally tonight, you might think of boxing as a tough, aggressive sport, but a group in Trenton sees it as a solution to gun violence. The Guns Down, Gloves Up summer boxing program is a free initiative that teaches kids in the state's capital city more than just how to protect themselves in the street. It offers lessons of discipline, emotional regulation, and of course, alternatives to violence. Our mental health writer Bobby Breyer recently stopped by the boxing club that hosts the summer camp and shared what he saw. Bobby, this is such a unique alternative to looking at violence. Why did these folks tell you that they found it works? Yeah, you know, Salvation and Social Justice, uh, now that the program, the boxing program is in its third year, have really pointed to not only the physical benefits of uh, teaching the art of boxing uh, through the uh, physical techniques and the uh, discipline that comes along with it, but really they said that this works because it's the lessons outside of the ring that matter most. Really those lessons of, of mental health, of emotional regulation, and is also self-confidence and self-discipline aspect as well that have proven to be beneficial for kids, not just during these uh, weeks that they're in the summer boxing program, but for well afterwards and, and for years to come. So managing those complicated emotions and how mm -hmm. that mirrors some complicated situations that they might find themselves in because this this targets what kids who are in the teen years or what age group that's right so kids between the ages of 7 and 17 and they've seen a growth in the program over the years so the first summer that they hosted it salvation and social justice saw about 20 to 25 kids enrolled in the program now they have about 45 kids as of late July with the capacity to host 50 so it's really caught a lot of wind in recent years and I think more so with uh, kids being out of school, it gives kids a place to go and to learn from mentors and coaches that they really look up to. What did you find when you went and visited and actually talked to the kids who were participating? Um, I mean, mental health struggles affect every age, but mm -hmm. definitely when kids are exposed to trauma like gun violence, it has a different set of lasting effects. Absolutely. The kids really spoke to the fact that when they started in the program, they were maybe hesitant uh, to join, but soon after, maybe the first time they did this, uh, they were eager to go back, uh, not just for the first year, but the second year. I spoke to uh, one child in, uh, in particular who spoke about how they had won MVP of the program last year and was excited to try to duplicate that effort this year around. So it's not only physical benefits of this, but also an emotional support group in terms of friends as well. There's a camaraderie that's formed outside of the ring and outside of the Ike Williams Boxing Academy, when kids are back in school, they recognize each other from the boxing program mm. and they're able to form those kind of friendships and relationships uh, for years to come. Yeah, so even if they're not necessarily friends, so to speak, they mm -hmm. don't need to be enemies, I guess. Exactly, and that was something that experts who I'd spoken to for the story had talked about, essentially saying that, you know, just because you're on the opposite side of an issue does not mean you have to be an enemy. This program really teaches respect for each other and respect for the self. And in addition to that, it really teaches the power of mentorship and how coaches and mentors from Trenton are really giving back to kids day in and day out through this program, not just now, but also in the months to come. And so when you look at this, uh, and if you consider gun 
violence as a public health crisis, which it has been deemed. How does this chip away at that? I mean, this is a small subset of kids. Of course, they're expanding, um, but the problem is widespread. You know, I think it chips away at it in a couple different ways. One of this is really relationship building. So when you have uh, a coach or mentor who has maybe been through a similar situation, they could talk about, um, you know, how to avoid those types of situations in the past. But really, as we've known for a while, exercise in and of itself is really a form of preventative mental health. Uh, there's been numerous studies through the years that have shown the physical benefits of exercising and really how that helps to reduce anxiety, depression, and combat some of those lasting symptoms of, say, post-traumatic stress disorder. So we know that there's both the emotional benefit from relationships, but also the research and the physical evidence to back this up to say that these types of programs are truly beneficial uh, for the long term. Well, it was a really beautiful piece. I enjoyed both your writing and the video that um, our colleague Genesis shot to go along with it. Folks can, of course, check both of those out on the website. Bobby Breyer, thank you so much. Thank you, Brianna. That's going to do it for us tonight. But before you go, a quick reminder to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen to us anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire team here at NJ Spotlight News, thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, and by the PSCG Foundation. Life is unpredictable. Health insurance shouldn't be. For over 90 years, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey has provided quality, affordable health plans to New Jersey residents. We have served generations of New Jersey families and businesses and are committed to driving innovations that put you at the heart of everything we do. Our members are our neighbors, our friends, and our families. We're here when you need us most. Horizon, proud to be New Jersey.